the vastness of the ocean makes it hard to imagine the variety of life it contains. But twice a day, the tides recede and give scientists a tiny glimpse. I don't know that it's instabilis, but it's definitely one we should take back and key out. Okay. Well, yeah, look, there's one down there, too. Yeah, let's take them back and keep them out. Those are cool. When people say they're going tide pooling, some people just look in the tide pools. But if those people would just look under the rocks nearby, um, they'll see an amazing diversity of organisms. Wow, that's cool. These are just some of the fascinating creatures that students from the Oregon Institute of Marine Biology are collecting today. And we have two species of Epiactus here locally. One's kind of a bright red and one's this more like brown green sort of color to it. So this is the anemone and this is the, the juveniles or the babies that kind of crawled out of the mouth and then attached to the base of the column. Whoa, look at this guys. A few feet away, Professor Richard Emlett finds a curious creature known as a gumboot chitin. This native mollusk is the largest of its kind in the world. It's like a big, very slow cow that goes around and eats some of this algae that you see on the rock. They can roll up almost like an armadillo rolls up. The animals are really magical. How they make a living, how they're shaped, how they work. I mean, they are really, uh, you know, they belong in Harry Potter novels. <laughs> Oh, here's a couple nudibranchs, guys. So this is called the shaggy rug. This there's one? two, both of them. See, there's <laughs> two. We should probably take a couple of those back so we can look at them more carefully. We plan to collect samples today for two reasons. One is so the students can learn things about the organisms. And the second reason is that we're collaborating on a project with curators at the Smithsonian Institution. The Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. has been collecting and preserving scientific specimens since 1846. So these have spaghetti-like tentacles. Today, the collection is being updated to include genetic sequencing information. Most marine labs along our coast teach an invertebrate zoology course, and so they've asked those invertebrate zoology courses to collect different species along our coast, ID them, take some good pictures, and then take voucher specimens that will go back into the collection. Students from this University of Oregon program are the first on the West Coast to contribute to the Smithsonian's barcoding project. In this day and age, we can take little tiny tissue samples and we can get genetic information, which in, in shorthand is called a barcode. This DNA identification process, it's opened up a whole new perspective on how we can consider the relationships between animals. And what that's led to is a revolution in our understanding of who's related to who and pondering how organisms evolved uh, over time and how diversity was generated from a few organisms to the wide array of organisms we have today. Good job. Beautiful technique. Well, I don't know if it's Identhyra. We'll have to get it back to the lab or Sabellaria cementarium. We've decided for our class to focus on annelids, so segmented worms, just because they are kind of an underrepresented one. It's a scale worm found on the gills of gumboot chitons. So these may not be the most charismatic members of the animal kingdom, but this orange ribbon worm is both an essential part of the intertidal food chain, as well as the scientific record. Good find, well done. Ooh. And so is this lump of limpets, clinging to a clump of seaweed. Well, let's bring this whole wad back. And this shell of snail, known as a nudibranch, or naked gill. I'm gonna barcode a couple nudibranchs just because I'm a nudibranch fan. <laughs> They're a little hard to appreciate with the naked eye, but when you see these guys up close, they seem pretty charismatic after all. They have something called a branchial plume that surrounds the anus. Um, and that's how they breed. I don't think it's a lamellarian. I mean, it's got a I little, mean, it, you know. Almost look, oh yeah, no, it's got a little anal plume. For most of us, this, this kind of tide pooling right is a little yeah. bit of a nerd fest. That is cool. But the zone between the high and low tide is home to some of the cleverest and toughest life forms around. This one's a decorator crab. And you can see it kind of has this, these spindly sort of uh, legs. And some of them have kind of a Velcro-y sort of patch that they can use to kind of stick stuff to them. It's occupied by mostly marine organisms, ones who've evolved to live in an intertidal setting where they get uncovered and it can be harsh. 
take a look at this shell-covered anemone pancake. This is actually 50 or more uh, small individuals all covered with shell fragments. And that shell material is perhaps a sunscreen. It protects the anemones against uh, intense sunlight. These sea palms manage to hang on in the most wave-exposed areas. These things are incredibly tough. Look how they flex and bend. It's an annual. Its life cycle depends upon the waves because the spores dribble off the leaves, and next spring, there'll be new sea palms growing in the same spot. The intertidal zone is incredibly diverse. There are lots and lots of things that you just don't find anywhere else. It's just a lot of fun to study these things. Okay, guys, um, I think it's time to go up. Uh, the tide's coming back in, and uh, we ought to go back and get cleaned up for lecture. See the excitement about that? <laughs> Once the animals are collected, the students take them back to the labs for a closer look. Here, high-powered microscopes reveal the tiny broom-shaped appendages that propel this worm through the water, and the extravagant fluff of a split-plume feather duster worm, or the feeding fingers of a fringed filament worm, and the creepy ridges of a tunnel-tailed orbit worm. Here's the scale worm that was found in the gills of the gumboot chitin, giving its all for science. So we're going for about one millimeter dot sized. Yeah. Very tiny amount of tissue is actually needed for the DNA extraction. There we go. Once the specimens are processed, the Smithsonian enters a detailed profile of each animal into the Barcode of Life data system with pictures and a genetic fingerprint complete with barcode. It also provides an important reference for the future. There are huge challenges today with species extinction and habitat disturbance and that sort of thing. And one of the goals of this inventory is to try to document the diversity uh, before it's too late. So next time you go tide pooling, watch your step. And remember that some of the most interesting creatures anywhere actually do live under a rock. <laughs>